Excellent. I'll um, quickly hand you over to Ross Smith, who's going to tell us about um, building your own microcomputers. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Ross Smith. I'm a uh, postgraduate student from the University of South Australia. Um, today I'm going to be talking about how to build custom microcontroller projects from scratch. Um, just to give you a bit of background first on my experience with Linux so you, uh, you know where I stand. I was a Windows user for many, many years. About three years ago I started using Linux and I've slowly been transitioning over to uh, using Linux more and more. Uh, to the point now where I don't actually run any Windows machines. So a lot of the uh, is not for um, electrical engineers, it's for people who don't have a degree in electrical engineering who would still like to play with microcontrollers. So um, I'm from that position myself. I've got a computer science degree and I don't have an electrical engineering degree, yet I'm able to uh, build and make electronics to solve problems and build prototypes and that type of thing. Uh, then I'm going to uh, talk about a couple of different software applications that are available and which you can use for uh, capturing schematics and uh, making printed circuit board layouts, uh, followed by the actual etching process where you go through and make the uh, physical PCBs like this type of thing. Uh, but we'll have some screenshots of that shortly. Uh, then I'll talk about some uh, MSP GCC, so how you go about compiling some of your the programs for the microcontrollers, how you go about um, uh, getting that actually onto them, and a little bit of debugging. Uh, some quick code examples and some interesting uh, previous projects. So I can show you some of the things that I've done in the past and uh, I've got the, like, a set of pinch gloves that uh, was one of the things which you can actually try out in the open day if you get out there. Oh, and the, other, the last thing I'm going to talk about is some of the problems that I've had because that's one thing I always find that uh, is missing in the presentations I see. I like to know of all the problems that people have had in the past. So I'm going to try and tell you some of the things that I've experienced while using the uh, MSP430 range of microcontrollers. Okay, so uh, the reason why we use microcontrollers is because we want to develop prototypes. We want to make things uh, like 3D user interfaces, we want garment integrated electronics, and these type of things. And basically, our set of motivations there is we want things to be small because we want to be able to wear the electronic devices on your body. Um, so we want to have small batteries and small overall components when we do this. Um, so there's a number of different microcontrollers available, and the reason we use the Texas Instruments MSP430s is that they are very, very low power. So that's, that's what I'm mainly going to talk about today when I talk about these designs, because that's what uh, we have chosen to use. There's many other ones, so I don't think there's anything against, I don't have anything against these other ones, but these ones uh, uh, suit our needs. Uh, and, and they're cheap, they're actually effectively free if you're doing uh, for prototyping and stuff and they're, they're quite uh, reasonable if you want to take it into uh, production. Okay, so the specifications are shown there of what the MSP430F1232 has and you'll see that the voltage range you run the thing on is 1.8 to 3.6 volts, so they're quite low voltage. Uh, they require a higher voltage when you're programming them, you must have above 3 volts but in running mode they only need 1.8 volts and above. But then the more interesting facts are the, uh, the amount of power consumption that you actually use. They have five different uh, levels of power consumption you can actually put them into. Uh, so I've listed the fully operational mode, which is using 200 microamps at 3.3 volts, as opposed to when we can maintain the RAM state that we turn the CPU off and we have um, RAM retention at 0.1 microamps at 3.3 volts. So you can see it doesn't use very much power, and we can use very, very small batteries and drive these for a long period of time. Um, so the gloves I've got here have a, uh, a lithium polymer battery which will last us many weeks or even months uh, when we're just using the MSP430. Uh, some other things about it, so it's a 16-bit RISC architecture. We have an analog to digital converter on there which provides 10-bit results for us. We have a serial port which is available, so it's a hardware serial port so you don't have to do software emulation of a serial port. Um, we have some flash memory, some RAM and Interestingly, we have 22 uh, general purpose input output pins, so that's what we can attach uh, buttons and uh, serial ports and all those types of things to. Uh, and the Wikipedia links there provided there if you want to go read a little bit more in depth about their specifications. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I'm not an electrical engineer, but I am able to build uh, microcontrollers and reasonable prototypes given a certain amount of knowledge. And there's basically three things that I had to learn uh, to be able to do this. I had to learn how to take control of input output pins, 
being probably the biggest thing that you've got to learn. Like one of the first things you usually do when you play with electronics and microcontrollers is you make a, a lead flash on a board. Uh, so learning how to control input output pins is basically how do you get that lead flashing and how do you read in the button. So I'm going to start on the next slide to show you two quick circuits on how you go about actually designing that in a schematic. And uh, the next thing we'll look at is the RS-232, so a serial port, because that's another hugely important thing to us, is we need to be able to do something with all these results and buttons and things that we're pressing. We would need to be able to send them to the PC and use them afterwards. And finally, analog to digital converters. They are reasonably important. That's basically a way we can interface from the analog world to the digital world. So I'm going to come uh, show you a couple of code examples on how to do that and just how the uh, MSP accepts inputs and things. So input and output. Um, the first thing we'll talk about inputs, and I've got an example here with a very, very simple schematic of how you attach a button to a microcontroller. So if you look up on the diagram here, you can see on the right-hand side we've got an I.O. pin. That represents the I.O. pin on a microcontroller, in our case the MSP430. So we've got to add two components to be able to attach a button. We've got to have a button uh, and we've got to have a resistor. So we, the reason we have a resistor is we have to set a, a basically a default state where we pull uh, the line low all the time and then when we press the button we want the line to go high. So I, I show you this just so uh, for those who are beginner and stuff you know where to start looking for how to attach a button to a microcontroller. Um, the next thing uh, which we do on IO pins is the output. So with most microcontrollers you can generally get a very low powered LED and attach it directly to the microcontroller and you can use that um, to debug and get things going, but the first thing you want to do is probably attach a high current device. Uh, so there's a number of different ways you can attach a high current device to a microcontroller. Of course the most simple is you put a transistor in and you use it as a switch. So you have a simple transistor circuit uh, which is shown in the second schematic on the bottom there. Um, perhaps there, there's a number of different types of transistors. I've often used Darlington transistors in the past because they're quite easy to attach to microcontrollers. Uh, you usually don't have to have resistors and things and biasing and stuff like that. So that was probably a good idea to look into the Darlington ones if you'd like to use those. Uh, so we use that where large currents are required if we want to drive um, fans and things like that. It's a good way. Uh, often the transistor is then attached to a relay if you want to interface with, say, a 240 volt system or something like that. Okay, so the serial port is another thing which is um, actually really easy to get working. but when we want to talk to a computer, we have different voltage levels between the microcontroller and the computer. So you have to put this one chip in, in between. Uh, it's a common one is a MAX232. And all it does is swap voltages around between the two. It's basically a matter of connecting four lines. You connect the RX and the TX to the serial port of your computer, which is shown in the schematic on the uh, right hand, uh, left hand side on the bottom. And then you have to attach, in this case, pin 34 and P35 to the microcontroller. So it's four wires are the important ones. And then the data sheet tells you the remaining pieces that you have to attach. So there's a few capacitors and things like that. But basically, there's not very much to do. It's just attaching these different components. And then once we've done that, we can uh, talk to a serial port on a computer. But this is um, also can be used uh, in cases of Bluetooth and things like that. There's some interesting modules you can basically attach directly to um, the microcontroller, which, do all the, which they emulate the serial port so you can talk over Bluetooth. So that's um, something I'll talk a little bit later about as well. Um, the last thing I had to learn about to be able to do this was a little bit about analog digital conversions. And basically all I needed to know was I had to supply some analog voltage between uh, 0 and 1.5 volts for example. Um, so if I wanted to monitor a position like an old joystick does, you have potentiometers in there. Uh, and they basically use a voltage divider to generate these different voltages and you can then uh, read in what the voltage is to work out where your position is. Uh, analog digital converters can also be used for other things. I've used it uh, for battery monitoring, which is another uh, useful thing to do when you're um, uh, in the example of the pinch gloves, we have battery monitoring on there so we can see the current state of the battery. It tells us the voltage and we can see when it's getting flat and we can send messages and disable things when that happens. Okay, so just some other notes and stuff uh, about the choice of parts that you use. Um, places like Texas Instruments generally have a lot of surface mount components to choose from. Uh, I'm a big fan of surface mount components because you can squash a lot more stuff into a very small space when you use them instead of using divs. And there's 
a, a large number of um, reasonably sized surface mount components available to be used. So I use ones which are basically 50 mil, uh, and that's imperial mils, and it talks about the distance between two pins. And that means that I can reasonably solder that without needing crazy skills and microscopes and stuff like that. So it's quite reasonable to, reasonable to be able to solder these components. Uh, I have used some smaller ones in the past where you've got 20 mil pin to pin pitch. And as soon as you do that, you either uh, you, you need a microscope to be able to solder these or you need lots and lots and lots of patience. So I, I would suggest um, using the larger range of sur surface mount components. Of course, all, all the other things like resistors, capacitors, and diodes, they're all generally okay. They come in a, a range of different packages, but they're all so small that it, it doesn't matter if we choose the smallest ones or the slightly larger ones as well. Okay, so in the past, I used Protel to do my um, PCB uh, schematics and PCB capture. Uh, this is a really nice software suite. I used quite an old version. Uh, I used that for quite a long time. Um, Recently, I've swapped over to using Eagle. Eagle is um, also another software suite that has, a, it's quite similar to Protel. It allows you to put a design of a schematic into it and uh, then generate your PCB. It allows you to uh, make custom components. Uh, so if you don't have something predefined in there, you can uh, generate uh, a new schematic and a new footprint layout. Uh, the other thing which is really nice about Eagle is a lot of people use it. So with the, an example of the MSP430s is it doesn't come by default with all the schematics uh, and different parts with it, but you can go to the, um, the website and grab an extra library, uh, put it in the uh, libraries directory, and then suddenly you've got all the MSP uh, Texas Instruments chips uh, footprints and things available to you. So that works really quite well. Uh, we heard um, James Cameron who talked about some of the other um, solely Linux um, and GPL software. Uh, there's the X-Circuit and G-Eater, which are schematic capture tools, um, and then there's PCB. One problem I have with these is that I can't see the link between the schematic and the PCB. They don't, you're importing a schematic directly into the PCB program, and you don't have this uh, backwards lookup. So I, I'm concerned about the design rule checks there, whereas with Eagle and Protel, you have this integrated design rule check and if you change something on the PCB manually it, there's, a, there's a problem because they don't match between the schematic and the PCB. So that would be one of the things that um, I'd like to know if there's another solution. If anyone else could help me out with that, that would be great. But at the moment using Eagle is a, a nice way to get around, around the problem. Uh, of course Eagle um, is freeware so it's, it's available to Linux, Mac OS X um, and Windows. Uh, but they do have restrictions on the freeware license and stuff, and they, they only provide you a very small board area to work with. Uh, they only have double layer boards, which is perfect for hobbyists and people like me who don't want to have crazy eight layer boards and stuff like that. Um, and you can only have one schematic, which would be nice if um, you could have multiple schematics to componentize your designs. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is the etching process. Um, I'm going to talk about this quite a bit because um, I've heard a lot of people in the past say it's difficult to do things like etching in two-layer boards and you've got to deal with alignment um, issues and things like that. But it's actually not, not very difficult at all and it's quite cheap to produce these boards. So the first thing I'm going to point out is the clean working area because it always ends up that you don't have a clean working area in the, these uh, environments. But it's really important, you've got to remember that you're working with chemicals um, and you need to wipe it down and and your, your results of your product seem to be a lot better when you have this clean working area. So I thought I'd say that because I've taken these photos where things are sort of uh, reasonably neat. Okay, so from your PCB uh, software, we want to generate a transparency. And when we do a single-sided transparency, it's simple. We print it out and we attach it to um, a piece of uh, PCB material and we continue the process from there. But when we have the two-layer design, we need to think about how do we get the two sides aligned together because we need to make sure that all the veers and things uh, line up directly, otherwise basically the board's useless. Uh, so one of the techniques I tried in the past for doing this was where you drill holes in the board and you try and line up the uh, holes with the transparencies and then you stick them in place. This kind of works but it's kind of slow and not very nice and it's difficult to repeat the uh, quality of the boards if you want to make more in the future. So what I do now is I take some transparencies, 
Uh, I print both sides of them. Uh, when, when I print them, I always make sure that the printing is on the inside and against the board. This uh, increases the quality so you don't get so much bleeding. Uh, and then I take the two sides, I very, very carefully align them, and I get some double-sided tape to stick the two pieces together. So once you've got the, uh, you basically set up an envelope like this, and you end up with these two pieces that are virtually perfectly aligned, but it means we can now reproduce the uh, PCB many, many times without having these errors. So at that point, we, we use it as an envelope, and we slide in the material, which I'll show on the next slide, but um, we slide it in, in there, and we can push it hard into the corner. So we have this prepared section for the uh, UV process, which we'll look at now. So the PCB material, I, at the moment, are using pre-sensitized material, which is uh, Kingston, I think. Kingston, PCB material. Basically, it's a piece of fiberglass with copper plate on both sides. And then on top of the copper plate, there's a uh, photoresist material, which has been painted on each side. And then on top of that, there's a piece of plastic, which is protecting it from the light. It is sensitive to UV light. Um, I've taken a photo, order, photo of it in this part here. It's probably not something that I should have done because it, it may have slightly exposed the, uh, the uh, photoresist material there. But so what you do is you open the packet up, you remove these two, two strips, and you place it into the envelope of the, uh, that we made in the previous step. What we do then is we uh, use a UV light box. So you can see in the bottom photo here, I've got a UV light box. Uh, we've only got a single-sided light box, but that's okay. So what we do is we then place this envelope that we prepared into the UV light box, close the lid, and set the timer. And these take about six and a half minutes with my UV light box. It's a number which you kind of uh, have to experiment with a little bit because you need to make sure that it's, uh, it's not overexposed or underexposed, and it varies depending on the intensity of the, uh, the UV light. So once we've done one side, we need to actually take the envelope out, flip it over, over and close it again and re-expose the second side. And once we've done that, then we're ready to uh, develop the uh, printed circuit board. So there's some photos here you can see. Uh, in the top one, I've uh, got some gloves on, so I'm not getting chemicals on my hands. And I'm putting it into the pre-prepared um, alkaline powder, which is used for the developing in this process. Uh, so what you do with this is, it's all quite visible. You basically put it into the tank and you, you gently agitate it and you'll see the uh, photoresistive material come away until you can see the circuit, which you, should be the same as what you've just had on your uh, envelope if everything's worked correctly. So once you do that, you take it to the next step, and you can see it a little bit more clearly there, where we rinse it in water, and you can see the circuit um, is quite clearly laid out on top of the uh, PCB material. Okay, so the next step is to go, okay, we need to remove the copper that we can see, so we can be left with the um, etching, uh, left with the uh, tracks and things we want in our circuit. So there's a, a number of different ways you can perform etching. I use a chemical called ammonium persulfate. The reason I use this over ferric chloride, which is perhaps a little bit more common, is the ferric chloride becomes dirty and it's very difficult to see what's going on. Whereas with ammonium persulfate, it remains uh, somewhat transparent. It actually gets a bit of a blue tinge to it uh, from the copper sulfate that's generated. But it allows us to um, watch the etching process as it occurs. So you know when to cut it off. You don't have to base it on a time. You can look at it and you, you watch the copper slowly uh, dissolve from the corners. And it, once it starts dissolving in the corners, it very quickly uh, leaves just the remaining circuit. It usually takes another 30 seconds and you're left with just the PCB, which is shown in the next picture below that there. Okay, so once you've got to this stage, there's basically a few, few things that you still need to do. You need to drill all your holes for all your veers and your header pins and things like that. So you can hand drill um, veers just using a drill press uh, or a hand drill if you like. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a CNC mill, it's really nice. You can export those files straight from, uh, from Eagle and plug that into your CNC mill and it will go through and drill hundreds, thousands, whatever of holes out directly uh, onto the board. So we actually have a TAG CNC mill at work, so I'm lucky enough to be able to do that, which just, the only difference is it makes it much, much faster. I've hand drilled many um, PCBs in the past and they work just as well. Uh, one thing uh, that I've left out of this process is um, occasionally we put a tin coating on the boards. Um, that's not necessary, but you can buy another mixture that you put the PCB into this uh, it's this solution that leaves a tin coating on there. It takes about 10 minutes to do it, 
Um, it's quite nice because it reduces the uh, corrosion issues that you have when you just leave uh, bare circuit boards like that. So it's not necessary, but it makes your life a little bit easier when you go to solder the components onto the board. Uh, which is the next step you need to do is you need to do things like soldering the beers in so you have a connection between both sides on the board. So you put a piece of wire through and you solder each end and cut it off. I think there are some maybe more fancy ways of doing that, but that's the current technique that we use um, while we're making them. Okay, so I said I would talk about the aquarium parts. Many of you are probably aware, some of you maybe aren't. You can acquire many, many free samples from a lot of these big companies because they like to get their name out and uh, give, get people using their products in small quantities. So the MSP430s, if you go to ti.com and um, go to the microcontrollers link, you can basically look at all their different microcontrollers. And with the MSP430s, they actually have samples available of all of the low-end ones and most of their high-end uh, high chips as well. Uh, they usually come in quantities of five um, and they have a limit on the number of different samples that you choose, so you can have like eight samples in a batch. But it's really quite easy. You can go through, read the data sheets, read about the ones you want, get voltage regulators and other things like that, and a week later it turns up. You just fill in an online form, you don't have to talk to anyone or anything like that. Um, but the free samples is a really, really nice um, th thing that they offer, and it, it gets the product out there. And then people like me come and talk about it, and hopefully lots of other people use them, and they end up being used in products. So I think everyone wins from the whole free sample thing. Uh, there's a few other companies that I've used in the past, like Maxim, they provide the level shifting chips we talked about before, for the RS-232 conversions. Um, there's also National Semiconductors, I've used some uh, H-Bridge chips from them in the past, and they're, they're quite good. They have a little bit different policy, they insist that you don't have more than uh, one set of free samples per week. And that, that's still quite good. Okay, so when you go to program the um, MSP430s, there's a few different ways, quite a few different ways you can choose to do it. Um, I originally started using the Code Composer, which is basically an Eclipse based environment. Uh, it comes directly from the TI site, and they've integrated um, uh, a debugger into this environment, so they use the SIGWIN DLLs and GDB and stuff from Windows uh, to run all this. But I, I use this for a long time. It actually works quite nicely. They've got a very nice GUI and stuff attached to it. Um, however, later on, I've gone into the using of the MSP GCC, and that's also quite nice. And it's the, one of the advantages over the MSP GCC is it doesn't have limits on sizes, so you can program all the, the high-end chips as well. Like they restrict the um, code composer to the size of the binary you can produce at the end. So that hasn't been a problem for me. Um, with the simple designs, but as soon as you start putting a lot of code and complex things on there, it can become more of an issue. Uh, so the way that you program these devices is they have uh, two different ways. There's a JTAG interface, or you can program by the serial port. The JTAG interface is um, probably the better of the two ways. That provides you with runtime debugging, so then you can use your GDB, and you can have your breakpoints and your watches and all that kind of stuff and see what's actually going on when you're running the program. Uh, the only downfall of using the JTAG interface I've found is when you uh, attach it, you have to use four I.O. lines on your microcontroller. So I said we've got 22 I.O. lines, GPIO lines available. Four of those, if we're using them for debugging, we can't send data across them. Uh, so it's just one thing to watch out. You can avoid it. You can still uh, use those pins maybe for buttons and things like that, which aren't so important, where we don't have lots of information going across. But it's just one of those things that I kind of got caught on when I did one of my first designs. Uh, so I thought I'd mention that, so hopefully um, you guys don't get caught out of the same things. Um, the GDB side of things, it's basically all the normal GDB stuff with these few extra commands which are available to you. So there's an erase option, you generally do this uh, at the beginning, you erase your you do monitor erase all, and you erase the information that's on the chip, then you load some program, whatever you want to do, directly onto it. There's a few other things available, so there's some reset commands, there's some identify what's actually attached, um, there's a uh, JTAG and a VCC and a dump so you can read the data off. So there's a few extra things but it's not too difficult, so it's basically, it works really quite well and I didn't really have any issues with the whole GDB thing. Uh, I put this slide in just for forms of debugging. Um, I talked about the runtime debugging already with the JTAG. You can use your serial port for debugging, so you can send stuff across the console. We've done that in the past where we send uh, just information to current states and things like that. 
And occasionally I've used LEDs for debugging things as well. So watching for like flashing lights and sequences and stuff to see what's going on inside the program. Um, generally I haven't had to do that lately. I remember doing this, this in the past before I actually had the JTAG interface. So um, if you don't have that, you can still do these other techniques. Okay, I thought I'd just show a couple examples of source code because I wanted to show you how easy it is to program these things. So this is probably like the first program that most people write when they work with microcontrollers. This is how to get a LED flashing um, uh, on a microcontroller and we're using pin 1.0 in this case. So all you've really got to do is set the direction. You consider all the bits inside the, um, as bit flags and we set uh, the first one to be an output because ones are outputs. We then have a, uh, a while loop that goes forever and we then invert the, um, the pin so we end up turning it on and off and then wait for a little bit so we don't do it too fast, we delay for a second and we go back and do it again. So it's going to effectively turn the, the LED on and off. Uh, another thing which um, we use is the analog to digital converter, so I thought I'd just show you what the code looks like for that. Um, this was an extract from something I worked on and basically you have to disable um, the device to be able to change the channel depending which pin you're talking to because you can have the uh, analog inputs coming on any number of those GPIO pins. Uh, we then select the cha channel, in this case I was using pin 2.1. Um, you can re-enable the, uh, the analog digital conversion after that. We then request the sample and we've got two options on, uh, I've got it commented there because there's two different ways. You can put the CPU to sleep while you're waiting for the result and wait for the interrupt to come and tell you when things are ready or you can uh, sit there waiting in a busy loop. So um, there's basically the two options there and then when it's all done we get the memory address and it gives us our answer. So it's really quite easy to write the code to grab an analog to digital uh, sample. Okay, so I was going to talk a little bit about the past project. So I've held this glove a little bit. This was a uh, set of pinch gloves that we made to be used with the uh, Timbit backpack. Basically, um, you can see on the uh, edge of the fingertips there's conductive, uh, there's pads. These are actually conductive material, so these are the switches. Uh, we use this to detect when you put your fingers together like this. And this is used as button clicks effectively in the future. Uh, the conductive material is then attached to the microcontroller using a conductive thread. So what we've done is we've sewn a thread into the gloves and that goes back up through the seams and then pops out here and is attached to the microcontroller. We actually used uh, small pieces of copper tubing here so that we could crimp that thread and get a good connection back onto the microcontroller. So now if we have a look up here, you can see on the back of my hand here, this is the uh, circuit, and there's, it's really quite simple. There's only a few things on there. You can see there's the uh, MSP430 microcontroller, which is the big chip in the middle. Uh, and then we have a voltage regulator on the power, so we just have to make sure that we monitor the voltage. And we have another uh, Bluetooth chip, which is uh, so we can transmit the results, so we can be completely wireless. This uh, board size was chosen in this case because that's exactly the same size as the battery which is mounted below it, um, which is one of the lithium polymer batteries um, we use because of the, uh, the good life um, and capacity we get versus size on them. The lithium polymers come often with a circuit on them to do monitoring of the battery, but these ones don't. These are basically a directly uh, attached to the cell, so we had to do a couple of things as I mentioned before, we actually have to monitor the voltage levels to make sure we don't damage it. And what happens is, as the battery gets flat, you'll see the voltage start to drop. When that happens, what I do is I, I start sending messages uh, across the serial line, so in our software we'll go, oh, we can notice the batteries are getting flat before everything breaks, so we don't get caught out without, um, uh, with it just stopping and not knowing what's going on. Uh, we also have an indicating LED on here, which is probably a little bit difficult to see in the picture there, but there's a surface-mounted LED on there which flashes, uh, and the flashing sequence will start letting you know that it will change from being rapid to slower, so it lets you know that the battery is starting to go flat. When we actually get down to 2.7 volts, we actually have to stop the, uh, the usage of the Bluetooth device, because the Bluetooth is quite expensive. It uses almost 100 milliamps in this case, which is a thousand times more than what the actual microcontroller is using. So we, at this point we uh, toggle an enable pin on the voltage regulator to disable the Bluetooth and uh, we effectively stop the MSP430 <coughs> so it's going to be in a state where um, that it's no longer usable so we don't use the uh, battery power and take it below 2.7 damaging our lithium polymer battery. 
So that, that was uh, one of the things that, um, uh, which I had a little bit of fun working out how to do, but it was quite, quite easy to do when I showed you the analog to digital conversion, um, uh, which we basically used to um, monitor the battery voltage in that case. Okay, so another example of where we've used, used this. This is, um, there's a picture of Wayne here using the Timbit backpack. You can see he's got a belt um, strapped around here and a hel helmet and stuff on. Inside that um, backpack, there's a laptop and a GPS and a bunch of other hardware that um, we needed to control using the MSP. Well, we needed a way of controlling it. So we chose to use one of these microcontrollers um, to provide a whole lot of different functions for us. Uh, one of the things that we did uh, is firstly initialize all the hardware. So when we flip the big main power switch on the outside, it has to go through and turn the laptop on, so it has to send a pulse to the laptop. And then it has to go through and turn the GPS on and a head-mounted display and provide the appropriate pulses for those things. Uh, another thing we did which was interesting was um, the, on the edge of the box we provided a little encoding wheel. So you can scroll between uh, different starting modes. It basically, you press a button and it, it says 0, 1, 2, 3, through 9. And so what we do is there is on the initialization of the system, we read that number out and we can start in different modes. It allows us to do things like, if we start in a, in a demo mode, it will just suddenly run and everything will work, in theory, anyway. And then after, if we choose a different mode, we might um, have a debugging mode where we print all the uh, results and debug the messages to the screen. So that was quite a nice feature that we were able to add. So in that picture there, you can see um, the internals of this, the, the backpack and the microcontroller board is here. There's not a great deal on it. A lot of it's on the other side. Um, but you can see we've got things like serial ports and we've got a bunch of IO pins going around the place to control all these things. Directly underneath that, there's a, um, a power supply board. So there's some DC to DC converters we use to supply uh, power to um, different things. Um, but you can see that the, uh, the size of it wasn't hugely important in this case, whereas in some other things we uh, use small ones. In this case, we uh, weren't too concerned about making it super mature or anything like that. Um, so all the uh, control of the system, when it's actually running, we can talk uh, serial to the device. and we, we can do things like, say, what's the current temperature? Uh, and it will give us the current temperature of the box. So we can monitor things like that. Uh, we can do other things like um, resetting the GPS from the software doing a hardware reset. So that's kind of nice when you have um, problems with the GPS. Uh, you can do things like the head-mounted display can be disabled. So if I, um, uh, say, have a power saving function, I can disable the head-mounted display so our battery life is increased. So this has allowed, the, the microcontroller has allowed us to do these kinds of things in the backpack. Okay, so I said I was going to talk about some problems. One of the most interesting problems I had was when we were getting corrupt data across the serial line. We were getting this jargon. Uh, it was working for a while, then suddenly we get this jargon coming across the port. And it took a while to work out what was going on. And on the MSP430, there's a, a, a couple of different things that you've got. You've got a digital, digitally controlled oscillator, which you can use as a clock. And I was using this for my serial port. What I was doing was I have an external crystal, which I was using to calibrate the DCO with. Um, but Unfortunately, what I didn't realize at the time is the DCO is not very accurate, particularly when the temperature changes. You get a massive variation in the clock frequency you get off it. So what was happening is we have this closed box and the heat was changing about 20 to 30 degrees. And then the, uh, eventually we get to the point where the clock's not running close enough that the serial core is going to work anymore. So we're getting this jargon, jargon coming across. However, discovering this was, was kind of interesting because we sort of thought it was heat, but we weren't really sure. So what we did is we uh, got a heat gun in one hand and we had a can of freeze spray in the other. And we, were, we started streaming data across as quick as we could, so we started thrashing it. And we got the heat gun and we heated it right up so it was ridiculously hot. And then we, took, we started watching the giant come through. And then we, sorry, and then we took the uh, can of freeze spray and you're watching all the garbled data come through and you'd cool the thing back down. And as soon as it got cool, data all looked perfect again. So we, that was one of the things that it took me a while to realize what was going on. I just thought I'd share that with people. So don't rely on the DCO. Uh, use a crystal which is very, very, very cheap. Um, I, I'm using 8 megahertz crystals now, um, which <coughs> cost us less than a dollar each, and that saves many nightmares and stuff in the future. 
Uh, I think I already mentioned the JTAG, pin, JTAG pins thing, so avoid using the uh, IO pins uh, for other things on the, on the, like if you're using the JTAG interface, um, because it, you can't send data, data across and uh, if you want to have runtime debugging. Uh, one of the limitations would be the 8 megahertz uh, crystal frequency. Um, if you need to perform a large amount of work, perhaps this is not quick enough. So I, that's the fastest that you can put on the earlier range of the MSP 430s. In some of the uh, later ones, the 2000 models and above, they started going up to 16 megahertz. So they have changed those, but I haven't actually personally used them yet myself because I don't require the extra speed. Um, but other things like peak microcontrollers do, I believe, have 40 megahertz and they're, they're quite a bit faster. So, uh, there's a bunch of links here. I, what I didn't mention, the etching process and all that sort of thing, I started putting notes up on my website. So, if you want to read about the etching process and if you want to remember all the bits that I've talked about, it's uh, r-smith.net slash lca2007. Um, I'm still working on a lot of the notes, so I will change those over the next few days and stuff like that. But the, the, there's um, bits and pieces and everything I've talked about today. And there's the various different samples and other things that are available. Uh, so, are there any questions? How do you interface the JTAG uh, interface to the computer? The JTAG, oops, you can make them yourself or you can buy them like I have done. Uh, you buy this device here, it comes from Texas, Texas Instruments, it costs about $100 um, and that provides all your runtime debugging. They have all the schematics and stuff open if you want to make one yourself. Um, so it's quite reasonable but it's a matter of tossing up whether the, the, the time versus making it versus actually just spending $100 and buying it. So we, we just purchased them that you could um, go in the future and make your own. Tool chain, the um, GDB, GCC, etc., etc. I, I mean, I presume it's a, it's a hacked version of that to put their own special stuff. Is that available as a nice, like, RPM package you can just drop in, or as a Debian package? Uh, I installed it um, basically from sources, um, which is not something I'd choose to do unless I had to, probably. Uh, so I provided notes on what I did. It, it wasn't actually very difficult. You have to patch GCC and recompile it. You have to have a different version of binary utils and things like that. There's about six separate packages that you need to work with. I can't remember them off the top of my head. Um, if you go to my link here, it's, here's the exact commands I ran to get it, download it, compile it, and everything I did step by step um, in very abbreviated short form. So that would be the um, what I could say about that. Yes, it is patched effectively. Um, so it doesn't just compile using normal GCC. You have to have a patch version. Yeah, so there's, there's probably an opening for someone to actually package that up into a ready to go. Just given, yeah. given the demand, I guess, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Ross.